All right, everybody. This is week three, Steps of an Accident Investigation. Um, again, sorry for the delay, but I'm glad I was able to get it up this week. Um, so initially, let's go over recapping some uh, key aspects from last week. So uh, remember an accident investigation, we want to find the cause, not the blame. We had just had a power outage. So if anything pops up on this recording, I'm sorry. My Mac just suddenly decided it needs to tell me everything since it just turned back on. So um, systems causation. So remember we spoke about different kinds of causation. Traditional was trying to figure out where the blame point was uh, and uh, over-focus on human error, where systems causation, we're looking at uh, an accident from a systems perspective and all of the various um, components and trying to find out where the causes may be. And humans are just one part of that system. Then we're looking at resilience and fragility. So remember we talked about this resilience with like the Swiss cheese method. Resilience is an example of something where multiple things can go wrong and nothing actually breaks or happens. Where fragility is, you know, single point failure. You have situations where failure seemed uh, it, like impossible to avoid because there just wasn't other fail safes in place. Um, as we go through this, and as we go through kind of every week, I want you to keep a critical eye towards your chosen event. Also, um, let me pull up a calendar here. I want you guys to be thinking about the uh, your specific event. So I think everybody's chosen the one they're going to focus on first. Um, and I will look into when we'll have like that first write up and presentation due. But I'm thinking it'll probably be first week of October. That's my expectation. So um, we'll talk about that more on Slack, make sure that that works for everybody. Um, and that I, I specifically, like I talked about in the first lecture, I wanted to make sure that your uh, it was before midterms. I don't want it to conflict with any other classes or anything. And I also don't want you guys overly stressed with it. I want you to kind of enjoy the process. Um, but yeah, we might do that maybe 7th, 8th of October or so. Um, again, we'll talk about that more as it comes up. But I specifically want you to be pretty steeped in your event so that as we're talking about all of this, you can ground it in that event. So in this, we're talking, we'll cover, you know, the first couple steps of the accident investigation process. And I want you to be thinking, okay, uh, this step, what does that step mean for your event? What did they do and how did they do that? So then we're looking at definitions. So this is something I will probably be putting in most lectures. Um, it's really good to be able to kind of have these ingrained in your thought process as you're going through uh, your events that you chose. And also if you are involved in an accident investigation ever in the future, you know, as we're going through and documenting things and talking to people, um, you'll want to be able to spot all of these, you know, um, the most immediate one I think of is barriers. So you want to be able to spot where barriers are, what a barrier is, and how to capture those in interviews or in documentation and those things. But, um, but kind of keep an eye on these things. And also, same thing, extrapolate these back to your event, you know, especially, you know, do they discuss the barriers? Do they discuss extent of condition or extent of cause? Which those may be follow-on effects. So sometimes what you'll see is they may not discuss extent of condition or extent of cause in a report, especially a public facing report, but there may be, you might be able to find articles or other sources that talk about the aftermath or the effects of this. Um, what did this do? What did this event do to the broader industry at large and things like that? And that might uh, give you some clues to an extent of condition or cause. Um, but yeah, just keep these in mind um, as we go through. 
So the seven steps to an accident investigation. Um, remember, we talked about a couple of weeks ago that there can be 15 steps. I mean, it, it really, this is part of that, you know, if you're doing an accident investigation within a Department of Energy or a Nuclear Regulatory Commission framework, they may have more steps uh, or NTSB. But this is kind of the foundational kind of grounded ones that you will see uh, either in in whole or they will break these apart into other steps uh, to fill it out, but these are the main ones. So first step, secure the scene. We all kind of have a night, you know, this is police tape. This is the fencing off the area type things. Um, documenting the scene. I think we've all been uh, beaten enough by police procedural dramas at this point to know what documenting the scene generally looks like. You know, you're taking pictures, making sketches, taking measurements, all those things. Um, and we'll go into each of these in more depth. Uh, those two steps are going to be the ones we're focusing on this week. Conducting interviews. So conducting interviews, we'll talk about it briefly next week, but then we'll go into and uh, I'll have a week of kind of more interviewing concepts specifically about how to do those later in the course. But initially, you know, you're going to be interviewing relevant people, relevant personnel. Develop the sequence of events. So this is uh, usually when your accident investigation team comes back together. Uh, you aggregate all of your data, all of your evidence, and you start to reconstruct what you think happened. Not what you were told happened, but what you think happened. Then you'll conduct surface and root cause analysis as necessary. Remember, surface can also be referred to as apparent cause, depending on your environment you're working in. Uh, determine solutions and write the report. Um, Acts investigations always have a report. Another thing to note as you're considering the report, um, you definitely want to make sure you're writing it uh, with a specific focus on, hey, this might be public facing. Somebody might use this report for a class like this uh, at some point. So, um, you know, that's a, a key part. The writing of the report is usually when, um, and we'll get into this when we get to that step, but when you may run into um, different nuances from, let's say, management or different organizations and stuff about what the implications of your writing is. But either way, it's still a key step. So when we talk about securing the scene, so why do we secure the scene? Um, we've all kind of, you know, again, you've seen enough police dramas of the last 20, 30 years and somebody steps all over the evidence or, you know, they and all the evidence is ruined or anything like that. But the real, re you know, that's part of it. But what we're really talking about from a conceptual perspective is we need to not just secure, it's not really about securing the scene physically. We want to secure the immediate context. We want to secure all of the specific aspects of the accident um, and the event as it sits and try to freeze it as much as possible. Um, I always think about this as um, there is, there's a couple of them around the world, but I know the one I'm, I think of is um, there's a museum uh, around the Martin Luther King assassination. And uh, uh, one of the parts of that is his hotel room that he left that morning. And it has been preserved in exactly the way he left it. So what does that give us here, you know, 40, 50 years after the fact, if we want to look at that, we can assess and understand the immediate context of that morning. Um, there's a lot of physical and just kind of realistic evidence that we can get from that. And that's kind of what we're talking about here as much as possible. Um, material evidence deteriorates um, generally a lot quicker than you think it will, um, especially, you know, some of you are covering uh, aircraft accidents, aircraft accidents often will happen in uh, poor weather or poor um, environmental circumstances, you know, so 
you know, rain erodes footprints and all that stuff. So material evidence will start deteriorating immediately. So it's important to preserve it in the way it is as soon as possible for the next documenting step. And memory is a huge risk in any accident investigation. This is one we're going to talk a little bit about memory next, because I want you guys to kind of understand some of the human factors folks might, this might be kind of old hat, but especially if you're not coming from a human factors background, or maybe I'll give you just a different angle on it. Um, but memory deteriorates even faster than the material evidence. So being able to secure the scene means securing the physical aspects of the, of the scene and the event and the equipment, et cetera, but also the people who may still be there. You know, that's an important thing. That's if you've ever been in a car accident, right? Everybody stay right where they are until the police get here because you don't want to uh, lose or have the memory of these individuals deteriorate or people walking away or whatever, and then you lose that key information. So going in a little bit on memory. So I like this chart because it kind of covers, especially at the top there, it's talking a little bit about the decay rate there in the parentheses. So what you need to understand is the way memory works is we receive sensory information and then it gets processed, um, usually within milliseconds. It will either get moved to working memory if it needs to be there, if it's something you're actively engaged with or attending. Um, attending is uh, like memory, like attention. Memory and attention are really intertwined. And then if it's incredibly important, you can start the, the encoding process may begin to move it to long-term memory. And we'll get into that. If it's not though, it tends to get deleted. So a great example of this is saccades. So saccades are, uh, if you're looking at a spot on your wall and then you look to the opposite side of your room, uh, try to do it without moving your head. Well, your eye doesn't teleport focus. So it actually moved fast, but it saw everything on that path. But you wouldn't remember that because that was sensory information that was deemed to be not important because it was part of a saccade and that's kind of hardwired into our brain. So that would be getting removed. And then encoding into long-term memory, chunking is uh, the term that's commonly used for deconstructing memories are uh, in uh, from the complex informational pieces into uh, bits that can be encoded in memory more efficiently. Um, you also will have, um, you know, some of the tricks and ways that we can do this. This is where you get to memory palaces um, as a cognitive tool for memory where you associate things with a physical location, um, repetition, you know, memorize, write this word 10 times so you remember it kind of thing from first grade or whatever. And then below that, we get into explicit and implicit memory. So explicit is your conscious memory, implicit, obviously, unconscious. And within implicit memory will be your procedural memory. So this is where you store skills and tasks. This is where, uh, you know, I know how to use a tape measure. I know to move my finger when I release the lock so that the tape measure doesn't smack my finger. <laughs> um, those kind of things that have been ingrained in you over time, they're unconscious. You don't actually have to recall them to use the memory. And that's kind of what we're talking about there. And then you get into declarative memory, which focuses on over on the explicit memory side, I guess, uh, which focuses on facts and events. And that is split between episodic and semantic. Semantic memory is your facts. Episodic memory is your events. So obviously episodic, you would be remembering episodes. Um, that's a nice way to kind of keep track of it. Semantic memory is what I call like Jeopardy memory. You're remembering facts. You're remembering dates, geography, uh, you know, what Newton's second law is, those kind of things where Episodic memory might be where you stored uh, a real life event that taught you about Newton's second law or something like that, you know, that's kind of how that breaks down. So when we think about this in accident investigation, right, 
by the time we get on the scene, we're long past sensory and short-term memory decay. So we're hoping that people remember things. Good news is accidents tend to be traumatic, so they tend to stick a little bit more. But we'll get into this in a little bit about why memory, some of the shortcomings of memory, so it isn't necessarily always as relevant. And the other thing to keep in mind is no one's perception is truly objective. We always experience and see and hear and smell from our perspective only. Um, and that is a key thing when we're talking about accident investigation. Whoever you talk to, no matter how informed or how much they paid attention during the accident, they're only seeing it from their perspective. So that's an important grounding principle as you go forward in the overall investigation. Going into, so this is the next, uh, this is kind of one of the more, I would say, prevalent working memory models. So remember, if we go back, this is working memory. So this is our short-term memory only. So working memory, you get your sensory input. It gets immediately stored in a sensory memory to see if it's important, The like the saccades. If it's not important, it's thrown out the window. Decay is, it, it's unnecessary, get rid of it. If it is relevant, we need to attend it. And so... If we attend it, it then gets transferred over to our what's called the central executive, which is made up specifically of the visual spatial sketch pad and the phonological loop. So the phonological loop is where we will store sound, auditory information, where your words, conversations go. Visual spatial sketch pad is where any of your sensor sight sensory memory will go. And then it's handled there, processed, maybe you do something with it, and then it will either decay or, or you take care of it and you move on. Um, or if it's extremely relevant, it will get encoded into long-term memory. The important thing to keep in mind is no part of this process is conscious. <laughs> um, nobody can, nobody decides to encode something in a long-term memory. You can take steps like what we just talked about to uh, increase the chances that you're going to encode something in the long-term memory or increase the chances of its accuracy. But you can't necessarily just stop yourself and say, okay, I need to save as and name it over here. That, that, that's not how our brains work. So, but this has kind of been largely untouched, I think, for about 50 years. I think it's, uh, in general, I think it works well as a model and we haven't seen um, any competing claims that are that kind of blow it up or anything. So if we come back to this chart, and sorry, it's a little bit blurry, um, but when we talk about this, you know, where are we during accident investigation? Okay, well, we're past short-term memory. So what about the people involved? Same thing. Oh, and I should specify this, and let's delineate this. We are at the sensory memory, short-term memory stage because we just arrived or got involved with this. But the people involved are past that. They're past short-term memory. And so you need to be aware of not just the perspective focus that people have, but how reliable can you expect memory to be? This has been a, um, a big aspect of, you know, focus on memory with like um, eyewitness testimony, first person testimony in court cases. Um, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, not because people are liars, but because our memory is not built to remember specific instances with uh, key characteristics. That's just not the way we evolve. That's not the way our memory functions. Um, so what do we look at from an accident investigation perspective? Essentially, all the interviews you're gonna do are gonna involve eyewitness or first person testimony, at least their perspective. So that doesn't mean it's totally worthless. It means that it's very, very relevant and very useful provided you place it within the context that it belongs um, and the con and you contextualize it with it's this person's view of this instance which means all of their perspectives and biases and um, belief structures and and things are all a part of that and it's important that's why we don't just take one person's uh, word for things <laughs> And then I want you to go to think a little bit about what are called schemas. So 
we talked about chunking into long-term memory. So a schema is essentially when you retrieve something from long-term memory, you are going to get a procedure or an episode or those things uh, for the situation you're trying to attend to. So one of my favorite examples is you walk into a store and you know how to get in the line. Well, how do you know how to get in line to pay for your goods? There's no sign, there's no instructions, there's none of that. We know it because within this context, this is the procedure that fits that context. Um, this is when we see things that just are slightly out of place. It's because we have an established schema and whatever else is going on is uh, in violation of that in some way. So this example, you sense something. Let's say you hear a bark. You turn around and you pay attention to, so you're attending um, the, a dog that you see. Well, you don't see a dog, you see a series of colors and shapes and shadows, which your brain then recalls information about these colors, shapes, and shadows within the context of where you're at in the environment and what you just heard with the bark, it activates the dog schema and then you respond appropriately with whatever your schema's response is. You know, you wanna pet the dog, you run away from the dog, whatever it is. Um, and what's important to realize here is you are just seeing colors and shadows and that your brain is forming this image of a dog and then applying it appropriately. Within that context though, let's say you heard a meow, turned around, saw the dog. Well, the sensory information is gonna take priority. So depending on the context you're in, you might then pivot to the dog and continue down this chain, or you might, okay, there's a dog, move on, looking for a cat. Or vice versa, you hear a bark, but you're in a hospital. You're in an operating room, let's say. Well, that's an odd context for a dog to be. That doesn't fit the schema. So you might land on different things. Keep in mind, none of this is conscious. And as we, this is why first person testimony is not valuable. When we call up the schema of a dog, we're not grounding that on, oh, the specific schema with this dog and this episode. We're pulling chunks out, which then are getting reassembled. So essentially every time you retrieve a memory, the memory changes because the context that you're retrieving the memory has a um, projective effect onto that schema. So it, it, the context is always slightly tweaking. So if you, saw a car accident and then were asked two weeks later about the car accident, you're going to recall the characteristics of what a car accident is, like from a concept, and then plug in the chunks as they fit. What our brain does, though, to stop us from like having to grapple with huge missing gaps in our regular like cognitive processes is it will fill in the gaps. So when we think, go back to our store example, we know how to go into a line, what the steps of this procedure are, what's expected. If we walk into a store, let's say you walk into a store that has like a really novel layout or something, I, you'll deal with this sometimes with kids where you'll say, oh, okay, well, we'll just find the checkout and do this or whatever. And they'll say, well, what if there isn't one? Okay, well, that doesn't make sense. We're in this kind of a structure, this kind of a context. This kind of a context comes with certain assumptions. So if your car accident memory, though, if you are remembering aspects of, let's say you see a, a giant truck, that's part of the car accident. And they say, well, who was driving the truck? Well, you didn't really see that, but your brain might fill it in anyway with subschema information like okay it's a giant truck and we're going to say in this area of the country you are biased to think that 
the person driving the giant truck is a man. So that's going to be where you start your schema, even though you didn't see that. But because it's within that context, now that memory has been changed because of that. So it's important to keep all of this in mind during our accident investigations. Memory is extremely fragile and can be manipulated fairly easily and subconsciously. There's a famous experiment. I've never been able to find the citation, but if I happen to this semester, I will share it with you, where they implanted memories of kids being lost in a mall. They took some kids that by all accounts were never lost in a mall and they made them believe they were lost in a mall. It actually was not that difficult. And then all these people had extremely detailed memories that they created themselves from what their concepts of a kid lost in the mall is. Um, and that's interesting. I mean, I don't think you could ever get away with that now. I think human subjects commissions and, or and institutional review boards would not allow that experiment to go through. Um, but it still showed that, you know, yeah, memory can be extremely suggested and then adjusted in a way that we don't even always understand. So the kind of point here is memory alone isn't enough. Validate any information or evidence you get from interviews and from first person uh, commentary with evidence and proof as much as you can. Um, so this is the objective evidence plus subjective evidence. Objective evidence by itself is usually circumstantial. You need the subjective evidence as well and vice versa. They kind of go hand in hand. So now we'll stop our brief detour in a memory. And so going to the next step, documenting the accident scene. So um, you need to accident investigation kits. You may need to retrieve one of these depending on the context you're in and what regulatory or, or supervisory world you're investigating, there may be these already developed and designed for that particular um, situation. Almost certainly there are accident investigation kits for airline events, um, for certain industrial accidents and things like that. And the point there is to eliminate human error where you may miss something by prescribing some forms or different cards, different note cards or uh, requirements checklists so that you can make sure that you get everything that's typically needed for those kind of um, investigations. Now, the next thing is how do you know what matters and needs documented? So this is the struggle. This is the experience side of things. So uh, at least initially, you have no idea what matters and what needs documented unless you have an experience with these industries, uh, equipment, or accidents like this. Um, so you don't necessarily know what matters and what needs documented. So in general, they're, they end up collecting massive amounts of information and data and documents because it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Looking back to your events, that you specifically chose? Was anything recorded that wasn't used or did anything unexpected become important? That's something that uh, you may have to read between the lines a little bit in your accident reports, but it's possible that, you know, the accident investigation was going one direction, some new information that was recorded and no one had really focused on then turned it in a different one. The next step when you're documenting the accident scene is to use all five of your senses. Now, within reason, we probably don't want you licking footprints, but you want to make sure that you are fully engaged in it. This is more than just, uh, you know, measurements and pictures and those things. This is what's the smell, what sounds are you hearing? Um, you know, particularly if it's an industrial accident, you know, uh, is it extremely loud in this environment? And if so, was your accident related to communication? Was that a problem to the communication or possible one of the possible one of the causes or causal factors um it's important to kind of consider that um because you, your environment is matters and is usually extremely important in the system's causation uh way of looking at things um in general we can assume 
that humans are coming to work or they're coming to this place to do the right proper thing. Um, people don't tend to maliciously sabotage their work or their or various places. Uh, it's not like a common occurrence. It certainly happens. But um, so in general, why did they fail? What are the systems too? These systems are not built to uh you know fail willy-nilly or just out of nowhere you know they they usually have signs there uh signs of degradation of pumps or various pieces of equipment so why did those fail you know you that's when you start asking these questions um always draw and sketch the scene this is I'm, there should be no instance where you don't um as humans we can process significantly more information and data visually than through almost any other medium. So that's why when you walk into an accident scene, you look around and you immediately have gotten more data than the whole of your report will ever hold within seconds. So it's important to always draw out and sketch the scene to try to make use of your visual processing power. Um, pictures and videos and drawings will also be critical in future steps as you start to assemble the accident scene. Here's a couple examples of um, sketching methods. These aren't hard and fast rules, but the triangulation method is really, really useful um, where you track movement and specific um, aspects of the event. And sometimes you can see where lines will overlap and there may be information there about what was going on with that. Um, and then the second one here is kind of like more of a timeline method. And the top one has uh, key information and, and a time, but it's not specifically walking through, you know, the time happened this, travel speed of the load, different things, and you're marking, you know, specific uh, time points in there. But it's kind of just, these are just examples. Really, you just want to sketch it out with all the relevant information and see, it's one of those situations where you kind of see what you see. You see what stands out and what seems odd because visually we can process information better. Um, especially if you have a large accident scene, you know, bird's eye views are useful. Well, we can't fly. So um, unless you have a drone to use for your accident investigation. The triangulation method or different sketches will enable you to kind of cheat and use some bird's eye aspects. Next up is initial statement collection. So this is not conducting interviews yet. This is just collecting initial statements. Now we'll go, we'll come back to this first bullet in conducting interviews as well. This is hands down your most powerful tool in interacting with people with the accent. You always ask, can you tell me anyone else we should talk to about this or who might have some helpful information? That is a huge thing. Keep in mind that we're trying to find cause, not blame. No one at this facility or involved with this accident believes that ever. They all think someone's trying out, they're out to get them. And if they slip up, they're gonna lose their jobs or whatever there. By involving them and asking them, you're, you're placing them in a position to be an expert on their organization or on their environment. Uh, you're an outsider, so you're trying to ask them for help, um, which can help really kind of move forward that rapport. Um, you'll need to ask about if anything has moved or changed about the scene since the accident. You know, if, uh, if emergency services had to be in there, you know, saving people or rescuing people, a lot of your initial material evidence will be changed or degraded or deteriorated because of that motion and action. Um, so you need to capture that. So you know, okay, where were people at? Where were people moving? So then when you come back and, and look at your evidence, you may know, hey, this area wasn't really touched by anybody. Nobody seemed to have walked over here. Um, again, finding cause, not blame, first impressions and goodwill will pay dividends later. We'll get into that a lot more with um, the conducting interview section. And no one wants to talk to the guy deciding if they get fired. That is by far one of the biggest things to, to mention is, you know, um, it's important to not 
you know, you're still an impartial observer. You're not sympathizing with these people because, uh, or, or being friendly or assuring them they're not going to get fired because that decision is totally outside of our hands. Our goal is to find the cause, make recommendations. If the company then decides to take HR or various actions, that's beyond what you're doing. You're not making recommendations along those lines. It's important to be straightforward with people there is, hey, I am not making recommendations of who to get fired or who is at blame. I'm just trying to find out what happened, how they can improve it. That'll be what's in my report. I have no control of what happens after, and I'm not making any recommendations to that effect, which is an important thing to kind of ask like that. They probably won't believe you, but the rapport that you can build may eventually kind of thaw that out and help you. And that's all we're going to cover for this week because conducting interviews is just such a big one. I didn't want to try to cram it into here and I wanted to keep our lectures pretty tight. So um, this week, um, one thing I, I think everybody's been great about or posting, but start discussing amongst yourselves on the Slack. So I want you guys to comment on each one of the posts from last week, specifically with um, you know, any questions, anything you want to, this is your opportunity to learn more about these events. Um, in general, most of the events that were chosen are really big name events that will impact the rest of accident investigation kind of theory and methods. So there might be a method that's undergone in your event that came from one of your classmates. So, um, you know, try to get involved with that stuff. Um, and then add to yours as you read more, as you kind of get more in depth. Um, what we'll do, so Todd, you know, had commented on my post sharing the lecture and that's where he put his stuff initially. What I want you to do, I didn't explain this well before. Each one of your posts with all of your accident information that you assemble and your kind of descriptions is where I want uh, these comments as well as any additions you make for now in that thread. So for example, um, if you found, uh, found out some additional information about this as you're reading through and getting that, you would put that as a comment on that initial post. This kind of helps uh, clear out and make the channel a little bit easier to decipher for you guys. Um, and then I'll kind of try to do better about um, directing you when I want you to make a whole new post and those things. Um, but yeah, that's, that'll hopefully clear it out. And then you'll have kind of a single source of truth for your take on that accident. Um, alongside with the commenting, just more interaction and engagement. So we're keeping the lectures relatively short because um, accident investigation theoretically is not a very deep subject generally. So but from an application perspective, it is. So the application is what you all are doing with your events. So um, I want to make sure that we're interacting and engaging enough, you know, for the course. So um, I'm still figuring out the best way to share slides. So that's TVD. Um, Todd said he wanted them. I don't know if anybody else does, but I'm still trying to find the best place to put them. I hate Blackboard, but we might end up putting them there. I tried OneDrive last semester and it wasn't super successful. So I'm just trying to figure out the best one there. So, um, and just keep in mind, you'll need to put together a presentation and slides on the event you chose. Again, we talked about that at the beginning of this, we're, I'm looking probably first week of October or so, but um, if you guys could, you know, shoot me a message if you have any concerns with that. Um, Again, if that lines up with a really bad time for you, um, I've been there. I don't, I always hated that professors weren't really very uh, plugged in with like students. <laughs> so um, I'm not really that way. Um, this isn't, you know, a journalism class. Deadlines are flexible, especially during COVID. So um, if you need more time, less time, whatever reach out to me. This is also the time to start reaching out to me if you are struggling finding information. So some of you picked events that there are probably so many reports, it's going to be hard to choose from. Some of you picked events that may not have that though. So reach out if you need those. 
um, so that you don't end up trying to uh, cobble together a presentation from either not enough or bad sources or anything like that, you know, let me know and we'll figure it out together. And I don't mind helping you out with that. So, um, so yeah, that's it for this week. Again, sorry, it was delayed a few days, um, but next week shouldn't be, and uh, we'll be good to go. Thanks everybody. Hope you have a good weekend.